if in your heart it's something you really know that you kind of really need to do, then I would say take take the leap of faith because it's really, I believe, it's about knowing that you individually, you are enough to you. It, it, there is no such thing as failure. I know that's part of the title of the show, but there really is no such thing as failure because the, the key to falling or failing is just get back up. Just get back up. It's okay. No one's thinking any of this stuff. No one's thinking that you're a jerk or a weirdo or whatever. They're too busy in their own minds thinking about their lives. And really, so just try, yeah, take the leap of faith. You, you won't regret it. Welcome to the Funny and Failure podcast, a podcast that celebrates failure and shines the light on the emotional side of comedy with yours truly, Michael Kahan. Wow. Today's chat is simply epic. Dirk has a brilliant mindset around helping others and allowing them to be seen and shine. I absolutely love his stories as a teacher and the philosophies there. We dive into them, but to say it's inspiring and empowering is an understatement. We could all do with a bit of the Dirk charm and wisdom. Anyway, this was a brilliant chat. I left it with a big smile. So let's get into it. Dirk Blocker is an actor and author best known for his work in television and film with his most recognized role as Detective Hitchcock in NBC's Brooklyn Nine-Nine where he starred in over 150 episodes. Dirk's earliest role of note was Abel McKay on The Little House on Prairie His first series regular role was on Black Sheep Squadron. Later, his film work included The Border, Poltergeist, and Starman, while also appearing on classic TV series such as MASH, Newhart, 21 Jump Street, Matlock, The X-Files, ER, and Deadwood, to name a few. Dirk also recently wrote and published the illustrated fable Master and the Little Monk. There should be some books available if you check them out in the episode notes. So as you can imagine, we dive deep and we cover a lot and we chat about celebrity death hoaxes, taking a break and going back to college in his 40s, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, losing his father at a young age, mentors and teachers, vulnerability, change, teaching, flow and his book. Before we get into this chat, in case you aren't aware, the videos are now available on YouTube under Michael Kahan. That's Kahan with a K, unless you're listening to it already. I'll still be posting snippets of these chats on Instagram under Funny and Failure, so check them out if you want to stay in the loop for upcoming episodes or you want to ask a guest a question. I'd also love it if you would share the podcast or share your takeaways from the chat. It really motivates me, helps the podcast grow, and ensures I can lock in amazing guests like this one. And just as a final reminder, the podcast comes out every Monday at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time with the video to follow the following day. Anyway, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's epic episode. I'm not sure if you're aware, but when I was doing my research, I found this legitimate um, YouTube page, and it actually unfortunately said that you'd passed away a few weeks ago. So I'm just wondering (laughs) how you're doing. I've seen those. They're just remarkably weird. Yeah. It's not just for me. I've seen them for other people too, and that I know... Are, have not, and you know, it would yeah. not be, that's not where you'd find out about these things. <laughs> yeah, YouTube and they're, and you know, I've seen some where they, they show the people like who've had their hands, you know, cut off and, and so they, they, they're sad, sad looking, you know, horrible disfigurement of these people, just the, the sad story of their, the final days, you know, and I think, God, who the hell is taking all this time and energy and effort to, uh, bullshit people you know, it's really yeah, amazing any, anything for the hits when i first saw it i had a for like maybe half a second i'm like oh shit uh what am i what am i gonna do and then i just I, missed him yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but when i saw the quality and how they speak about it and they try to do like a presentation you're right it's not the first time i've come across something like this does it bother you do you find it funny is it oh no i don't it doesn't bother me i i don't care if, i mean not that it's happened to me but i wouldn't care for it if they were saying something about you know some lie about politi- politically or something like that i would i would find that offensive 
but no, I don't, I don't get crazy. And it's, and anybody quite frankly, God bless them. Anybody who, who <laughs> sees that and gets, gets off on it or whatever, then, you know, let, let them, it's fine. It's okay. That well, bottom. At, at some level, it's nice to know that you are, um, I'm not sure if the word's worthy, but you've got the recognition and, um, <laughs> you know, you've worked hard in your career that you, uh, you've got the celebrity hoax that people. I might- made it. Yeah. I made it. I'm, a, I'm on the dead man's list. Yeah. <laughs> when you see things like that, has anyone ever messaged you or you're hoping the people you keep in your circle would uh, not fall for something like that? I, quite frankly, the people I'm in touch with, they might send that as a joke, but they wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't contact me about it. What the hell is this? You know, they know, they know what's going on. I, I found it very funny. And I would have thought like maybe when you're first starting out, would that have been the dream to, uh, you know, you've made it. You've got the all these videos that are celebrity uh, hoaxes. Do you think you would have enjoyed that? What do you think you would have thought when you were first starting out? Well, you know, when I was first starting out, the internet didn't exist. And, you know, there was no way for people to come put that kind of thing out there in the, you know, world. So it, it would never even cross my mind. I, I would never even have thought anything of it. I was just really just trying to survive one, one year to the next as an actor. You know, I was just hoping that somebody wouldn't catch up and realize, Okay, who hired this guy? Man? Let's get rid of <laughs> That's so interesting. I want to talk about imposter syndrome because that is so prevalent in the world. But I, I, what I found really interesting, especially about the start of your journey, is that you started professionally, was it at 16 or 17? 17. I was going on 17. I was 74. So, yeah, I was going. I hadn't even turned 17 yet. I was still 16. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, I didn't dive in like you know you know knocking on agents doors and this and the other i was just you know getting along in my life and i was doing a lot of plays in high school and i was approached by someone who said uh i i actually am in the industry he was an agent and he's like i i think you could i think we could make a living if you wanted to try this and i said oh okay i hadn't really even thought that that was something i was particularly meant to do Oh, I hadn't figured out what I wanted to do. I wasn't, you know, I was drawn to it, but I was drawn to a, a, a very, a various other things. Um, but I thought, why not? You know, why, 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 if this opportunity is in front of me, let's, it's an adventure. Let's see what this is going to, what may happen. And it worked out pretty well. So. I agree. And it's also kind of one of the only times where a random person knocks on your door and kind of says, uh, and they're legit. Because <laughs> we've had yeah. so many horrible examples of where they're not necessarily a legitimate agent as well. Yeah, right, right. No, I, my, as I recall, I think my mother and uh, and maybe somebody else who we knew checked up and he said, "Oh, this guy's this guy's the he's the real deal. He's 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 for real." So worked out. I'm glad that you found that. And then at that age, were there a few things in your mind or, you know, you're a young guy, 16, going on to 17, were there a few ideas? I think you mentioned you like sports. I don't know how far you progressed, but was there anything, was there any calling that you had where you're like, okay, I'm going to do this or you're just kind of floating by and see what would happen? You know, I was, um, I was a little bit lost at that age. My father had passed away like a year and a half or two years earlier. And, um, and I uh, took, uh, it was, you know, not the best decision in retrospect, but I took the position, the idea of um, avoidance, you know, just I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to accept that it was really happened. It had really happened. So uh, I was at that age primarily concerned with, I did pretty well in school. I mean, I always did okay in my classes and stuff like that, but I was pretty much mostly concerned with getting loaded. I just get, you know, go out and, you know, go out at lunch and drink a bunch of beer and smoke a bunch of pot and, you know, oh, that wow. kind of stuff. Did that, did that for a long time. Did that for too long, really. Uh, you know, just tried, it just didn't want to accept it. That's really the bottom line. I just couldn't bear to deal with the reality of it, you know. So that's what I did. I just escaped in a very unhealthy way, but, you know, you do what you do. You do, and then uh, we'll hear a bit about it. But, you know, having that understanding and realization, following your passions would help you with greater self-discovery and understanding and, you know, feeling more you. And obviously, you know, at such a young age to feel the loss of a father would be absolutely enormous. So you're coping yeah. with the best way that you could at the time as well? Yeah, I was, I was coping with, um, you know, I had discovered by that point in my life, how you know, the drinking a couple of beers is kind of fun. And smoking a little weed was kind of fun. You know, I, I had 
it, that wasn't when I started doing all that, but that's when it accelerated, it exploded. Um, and in, I think, I think in large part, I'm not blaming anybody. I, I take full responsibility for everything I did, but I do think that in large part, it was um, the example I had growing up. My father um, had horrible uh, military experience in Korea. He um, suffered great losses and uh, and great guilt for having been one of the survivors and so forth and so on. And in those days, the uh, according to him, and I suspect it's absolutely true, in those days they would tell people who were troubled, um, you know, look, you're lucky to be alive, and you should be grateful to be alive. And if you need to, go down to the Veterans Center, hook up with a couple of your buddies and have some drinks and talk about it. Yeah, wow. And so my dad started drinking. And I can't say that he was – he was. I never saw him drunk in my life, ever. And friends of his told me after he had passed, I never saw your dad drunk once, but, man, you know, he, he, was always, he always had a drink in his hand. He did until a doctor told him a few years before he passed, and the drinking – might have been related, but it wasn't a direct cause of his death. But a uh, doctor said, you know, you really ought to consider, st- you know, cutting way back or stopping drinking because he said, you know, you you know, it's not, not a good idea. And my dad quit. Wow. And that, I was talking to him. Uh, yeah, just immediately. Same with cigarettes. He had, an, you know, he just said, oh, okay, I don't want to die. So, you know, I'll stop. Wow. Uh, and a friend of mine who was, who kind of headed up an Alcoholics Anonymous Center, one of the first in Los Angeles, actually, on the west side of Los Angeles, uh, I was talking to him about it, and he said, "Well, then your father wasn't an alcoholic; he was just a, a, a he was medicating himself. He was using it as a medication to avoid, you know, avoid thinking about stuff that had happened to him." Yeah. So that was my, in a large part, that was my model. You know, that's kind of what I saw happening out there, and so I think that's part of why. Like I say, I don't mean to to assume blame to my dad for that, but. Uh, but the fact is that that was what I what I saw growing up. That's how I saw him deal with it because he uh, he exhibited other signs on occasion that indicated he was struggling with post traumatic stress. Really, of course. And um, yeah, when we're especially when we're young, we're sponges. We pick up from our role models and we see things. So I completely understand. You said that really well. I'm just wondering, with that understanding, did it help you eventually? Um, stop the um the drinking and the smoking or has that been a bit of a journey along the way um it it did it did help me especially much later um but uh i there was a part of me that got tired of you know there's an old saying i guess it was i'm sick and tired of being sick and tired you know and uh and i fell in love i fell in love with this wonderful human being who uh just she never, ever, ever once said, you need to do this or you need to do that or I, I won't stay with you if you don't, you know, kind of a thing. But she didn't. She enjoyed having a drink once in a while. She enjoyed, but she never, and she wasn't into the marijuana or anything like that. She didn't want to do any of that. But I, I uh, you know, I found myself, it was like, this is not going to work, you know, and I want this to work. So I started slowly but surely kind of taking care of it. And then I, and over the years, it just got less and less and less and less until it's kind of normalized, I would say. That's so interesting what a um, powerful like role model or love can do. We hear like, we, it can even be a career, for example, or a loved one. I assume this is your wife that we're- My wife, yes, yes, correct. And it's amazing just what someone when you, I don't even have the words to explain, but when you really feel like a connection, it can change everything for you. It changes kind of your perspective. It changes your values because they're kind of showing you a potential better way. So I love yeah. hearing stories like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No no doubt about it. She was incredibly, uh, and, you know, and as I uh, approached my 40s, um, even though I'd cut back on, you know, you have to replace a medication or something with something else, and I hadn't really found anything yet. And um, and I, I just kind of started spiraling a little bit and, and Hadn't really, and, and it, you know, it was time to deal with some stuff. So I uh, I went into therapy and uh, with her support, she was totally like, you know, I wish you would get it. I, you know, when I was having a tough time, I wish you'd get help. And I go, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But I don't know if it's for me type of thing, you know, I denial, denial, denial. And then when I finally got into it and, and got down the road a ways with the work I was doing, uh, 
it coincided, by the way, I, I, was, I figured out pretty quickly that my spiraling and depression was related largely to the fact that I was reaching the age that my father was when he passed away. Oh, wow. So it's like, you know, psychology 101. Hello. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, at any rate, once I kind of got, I started getting a handle on things and started, the clouds started to lift a little. I said to her one time, I said, uh, I said how the hell did you put up with me when I was, <laughs> when I was uh, acting like such a beast, you know? And she's just said very simply, she said, well, I love you. Oh. And I went, so I, I, so what she taught me right then and there was the meaning of, uh, of uh, um, unconditional love, which you know, is really powerful, you know. It is. Like we see it in the movies, and a lot of the movies don't necessarily do it that well, where like love is the answer, but you've actually, you know, you've shown and not told in the sense of what actually love can do. And it's something we don't talk enough about. It can really, as I said, can, it, it makes one be a better person and makes you – want to look at whatever is going on within yourself. So I'm very proud that you've got that. And um, congratulations to her for having Thank such you. a... Thank you. I'm, so, I'm, I'm blessed, uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, you know, it's also really interesting because we all have so many things that we uh, need to deal with over the years. But one for you to actually put your hand up and say, I want to go to therapy. I know you said that um, you're ready to stop feeling sick and tired, but... Sometimes we don't know what to do. And sometimes for whatever reasons, these are just some of the emotions people spoke about on the podcast. There could be shame, guilt. We don't believe in therapy, whatever. But to actually, you know, put your hand up and make a change, to me, that's so empowering because you're um, giving yourself accountability to hopefully move in a more positive t direction. So is it just, you know, you want to change your life? Um, you want to start feeling better? Was there anything else going on at the time or was it just time to um, move forward? Well, it was, uh, again, you know, the support and the, um, and not saying you need to go to therapy, which would have backfired, I'm sure. It's like, you need to stop smoking. Oh, yeah, let me show you. I'll smoke yeah, it. I'll you know, 20. whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, so my wife, so had, I had that going from her. And then a, 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 a person who was like a mentor to me, um, an acting coach who I met, who, uh, who was the guy, Harry Master George, correct? Yeah. And he's the guy I'd been looking for. I'd, I'd gone through various coaches and gained a lot of information from them along the way. But then I met Harry and it was like, oh, it all makes, this all makes sense. Now, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And he shared with the, his, with his students, me among them, that, uh, you know, one thing I got to say to all you guys is if, if you have I, uh, any hopes and desires to become a movie star, or a TV star, or just to work a lot and be really busy and productive in this business, he said, if there's anything in your mentality, anything that's holding you back, if there's anything that might be blocking you or, or causing you any consternation or concern, he said, deal with it. Take it from me. He said, I, I went through, he said, I've spent 10 years on the couch. You know, he said, it's, 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 or he said, it doesn't have to be therapy. It can be through with a priest. It can be with a rabbi. It can be with, you know, but get to the bottom of it, solve it. Cause uh, it's, if you do get lucky and you make it in this business, you're not going to have more time on your hands. You're going to have less time on your hands to deal with this stuff. What so unbel that was a good, that was unbelievable advice. Because it's not just yeah. sometimes when we want to be a guitarist and then you play guitar or we want to be an actor, we make that our entire life. But he's got this war of such forward thinking and holistic yeah. mindset in that you are your career and that working on yourself will make everything easier. It's very, how the hell did he come to that? It's one thing to like realize that, but then also to teach his students and make that a point of practice as well. That is remarkable. Yeah, he was a remarkable man. He was an absolutely remarkable and a born teacher for sure. But I think pri primarily, I believe, and I've heard his family members say since then, that most of what drove him is he just really cared about the kids. He just loved them. And he loved his students. He appreciated them so much that he shared with them whatever he felt like he could to help them, you know. It's still, it's sometimes, uh, you know, particularly as men and maybe a little bit at that time as well, we can feel um, a little bit of shame or too much vulnerability expressing our emotions and saying what we've gone through. So just right. to kind of like um, put that to the side and, well, not even put it to the side, but just say, you know, this yeah. is ridiculous and do it. That's uh, right. how you change the world is being able to learn, teach people from one's mistakes as well and being open well, to he sharing. He definitely helped change my world, and I know other students of his that say the same thing. And one of the things he mostly practiced was uh, developing. You know, you got to really develop your vulnerability. You've got to you got to rely on it. Your vulnerability is your is the essence, man. That's the uh, 
that's one of the key ingredients. You know, you got to get rid of all the bullshit. Get 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 the ego out of the way and just oh. you know you, you know that kind of thing. I feel like the ego is also very important, especially in this industry and in life. Ego is you know uh, very can play a lot in our mind. But you know, this kind of just sprung to mind. You know, you might have a big job, for example, and then you don't have a job and you're not working for a large period or why didn't I get this role? And I feel like ego is 50% of the, of the business is just being able to cope with, with everything that it entails. Yeah. Well, you have to have confidence, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, when it comes time to do what I do, um, ego, you gotta, it, it has no place on the stage. It just doesn't. Or on the sound stage or, you know, on location, wherever. And you can have it, but... <laughs> Let it, you know, get it, get it out of the way before you come to work, basically, you know. Without giving specific examples, you've mentioned that mostly over your career, you've dealt with lovely people, but I heard another podcast, um, you have had some people where it's, you know, the ego might be a bit more prevalent and you had a good take where if someone is like that, you probably won't be in the business for very long. And I think it applies to life as well, that if you've got a big ego and you're difficult to work with, no one really wants to be around you as well. Yeah. Yeah, why? You know, it's it's not worth it. I mean, when in my business, when people are putting together a series or a film or something like that, where you might be around this person for weeks and weeks, you know, you can have five actors who are right for the role, and one might have this quality and one might have that. So, really, a lot of times, what it boils down to is: Do, do I want to spend time with this person? Do I want to be around this person? And uh, and in my experience, you know, you just somebody said it pretty clearly to a group of students one time I was sitting in a room and someone said, you know, most of this all is just, just don't be a dick. Just don't be a dick. Don't do it. Just be a decent person, you know. I, I used to be an accountant in a previous life. And I remember when the managers, it was kind of, I don't know if you like your sports, but they would do drafts for who they would want um, oh, graduates yeah. to work with them. And it wasn't uh, about who was the best worker. Sometimes uh-huh. they would if it was a very big job. It was about, can I be in a room, a small room with this person for the next few months? And right. that was purely it, even if it meant yeah. more work. And I uh, only realized after I left, hopefully I was in that category of both. But <laughs> I, I found yeah. it very interesting because, you know, it's your time, it's your energy, it's who you, who you play your life, with. man. Yeah. You know, I mean, we all think that we're going to live forever and we all think that, oh, well, uh, you know, I won't feel old till I'm 80 or whatever we might think about anything. Life is a blink of an eye. When you look at the universe and you look at, you know, everything around us and, and the history of our world and humanity and everything else, it's like, really, you know, it's, it, this is going to, going to go by really fast. It does go by really fast. Man. I agree. Is this so, so don't be around a bunch of assholes. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, I used to always ask this question at the start of the podcast. I, um, I used to say, I can't remember exactly, but studies show that you kind of emulate um, the personality of like the top five people that you spend the most time with. And it made me think of when I was first starting, it made me think, well, who are the people in my life and are they either draining my energy or oh, is there a lot of conflict? And it doesn't mean we can't have um, the conversations to resolve conflict and work to make better relationships. But it essentially made me realize are there people in my life that aren't necessarily both ways working for the best? So I kind of went in directions where I wanted to spend time with people, you know, was more loving. So I'm wondering um, throughout this journey, have you had to make, because it sounds like you've gone on massive self-discovery doing all the stuff that you've done. Have you had to kind of make those um, decisions along the way? Yes, I have. Yeah. I've uh, had to make decisions about, you know, you know, what was, what is, what is this friendship? What is this? And uh, what constitutes love when someone says, I love you, you know, well, that's fine and dandy, but what is your definition of love? What is it? And once I, again, once I kind of figured out what unconditional love was, I realized that that's the only love. That is love. There is no other love than unconditional love, truly. I mean, the when, it, when it means something to me, wanting to spend time with someone and be with somebody, Um so yeah, there have been times, you know, where you, it's, I think part of it's just growing up. Growing up, you realize I was hanging out with that person because they had really good dope. I was hanging out with that person because, you know, they they you know introduced me to cool people, or I was you know all these different things. And it's like, but but is that a is that what really constitutes true friendship? You know, so I've you know I I'm I'm a believer that if you're lucky, if you can count on one hand 
five true friends, real friends, you know, and that's about what it's at for me right now with my friends. You know, it's like my, that's, that's, that's about it. I've got about five or six people in my life who really mean all mean a lot to me. I've got other people I enjoy their company and I don't, I don't, I enjoy spending time, time with them, but a real friendship that, you know, where there's a true understanding, a true, true connection and that I would rely on if I needed somebody to help me, you know, there's only a few really for me. Brilliant. I love that. I wish I heard that uh, many moons ago. I remember I used to go clubbing a lot when I was younger. And then when I stopped clubbing, I realized, you know, with certain friends, once you took away the clubbing or the partying, what do I really have in common and, you know, relationships. And it's a similar example to what you gave. And I used to, no joke, have over a hundred friends, people that I would communicate on WhatsApp and Facebook and actually see. But I realized I couldn't live my life like that. And, you know, I was more of a, um, quantity or a uh, quantity guy instead of a quality guy. And now I'm probably quite similar where looked at, it, yeah. and it, my life is so much better. It doesn't mean that I'm not, if I see the other hundred people, we still, we, you know, still have great conversations, but they're not in that yeah. core and right. life is so much easier and better. And yeah, that's my, yeah. that's my rants as well. <laughs> right on. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I feel the same way. So I have a, a gazillion uh, questions Okay, actually, we'll go back to, um, I can't pronounce his name, but is it Harry Master George? Uh, Harry Master George, yes, was, 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 was the fellow. Yeah. I found it, I find this very interesting because you mentioned that, um, you, you know, you were going, you were searching for a lot of classes and teachers and you found some good ones. I also mm-hmm. heard that, um, let's, let's do a bit of a timeline so it makes sense. So you were working as a young adult and then there seems to be a period where you kind of took a break. I'm not... Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering what made you take the break and um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. And then I've got follow up questions. What made you take the break of that period? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what era or period you're talking about, because I mean, I have had periods where the work slowed way down and picked up again and picked, and that's just, you know, the nature that's of the just business. the nature of the business, especially for character actor. Um, yep. And uh, you know, and um, but when I really kind of backed out of the business a little bit, yeah. was that same time I was talking about when I hit my early 40s. And, um, um, you know, the business was changing, and um, and that that's okay, but, you know, change is difficult, and it was for me a little bit. And then I – and but there was something that was bugging me, and I, you know, like I say, I, I got help. And one of the things that I'd been ignoring all these years, first of all, I – spent time finally grieving for my father. I had really avoided grieving for him. I had mm. never really grieved for him because I just ran away from it, you know. Uh, it scared me to death and um, or whatever, you know. It was just too, it was too intense for me. Yeah. But at any rate, um, on top of that, uh, I, 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 there, was, <laughs> there was a voice that I would hear, and it was my father's voice, and it was, he had said, because I lost him young, and uh, so I cl- clung to memories and things that I wouldn't, so I wouldn't forget, you know, him and our and our relationship. And one thing he said, uh, on a fairly regular basis, uh, I really don't care what you do with your life. That's, just, that's it's your life. That's why you should do, you should do with your life what, what you want to do. And I, hopefully it'll give you pleasure and will be productive and this and that and the other. But he said, but the one thing he was a teacher to begin with, he was, you know, he was a, an educator and he said, but at the very least, I hope, I really hope that you'll at least get a, a, a bachelor's degree in liberal studies, liberal arts. So, cause he was wise enough to know that that gives you a little taste of everything. And then from there you can decide if you want to, continue with education after that nice. and I, so I, I had this and again and one day when i'm kind of saying no again to an audition or something and i, and I don't really want to do that i no no it's not something i you know i i could use the work but i re- i just don't want to mess with that i I'm, I'm kind of fed up i was depressed you know i was just really i was depressed and um my wife again uh <laughs> you know in her own way uh, she said, well, you know, I've heard you say a, a few times, you know, over the years um, that the one regret you might have is that you never went to school, never went to college, you know, you never fulfilled. And, and then I talked about how, you know, that was a, something for my father and blah, 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 blah. And, 
And then, uh, you know, the usual excuses, it's like, well, honey, Jesus, I'm 43 years old. By the time I get a degree, I'll be 50. You know, what's that? And she said, well, you can be 50 with a degree or 50 without a degree. It's up to you, you know. And so mm-hmm. she's so smart. She just yeah, so wow. Smart. I like that. At any rate, uh, so uh, along with, the, you know, and then in therapy, I, I, brought, I brought it up, and I was highly encouraged by my therapist to say, oh, that's such a good idea. You really, really ought to take advantage of that if you can. Oh. And so I did. I, and and it's not that I didn't do any work during that period of time, but I prioritized. It's like I'd be three quarters of the way through a semester and getting ready to take final exams and my term papers that I've been working on were due and a call would come in and I would say, ah, I can't. Sorry. What do you mean you can't? You're an actor, aren't you? And I was going, well, not right now. I'm a student. right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm older than my, most of my professors, but <laughs> But I'm a student right now. I can't. And but once in a while, something would work, so that there'd be a, a period of time where I'd in between semesters or or a, on a break or something, something would come up, and I said, "That sounds cool. I'd, yeah, let's do that. I'll do." It. So I worked a little here and there, but for the most part, I didn't do a lot of work until I, you know, and then I graduated and and um, and got a, a teacher certificate upon my graduation. I then took a test and got a teacher certificate, and uh, and started teaching as well and i really like teaching a lot it was great oh it was awesome. really cool it was really cool um but towards the end of that year i said to my wife i said everything is so good i mean i feel you know our life we're we're we're, we're doing well i mean you know we're getting by we're not we're not killing but you know we're, we're we still have our house thank god and we're still you know hanging in there cool. and i said but i i, I do i now I, I do miss the acting i really do i said i wouldn't mind putting a, you know, a line in the water to see if I could attract any, you know, any, I don't, at that point, I, my agents had said, forget it, man. If you're, if you're a student, you're not my client, you know, and then those agents either died or retired or whatever. So <clears throat> my wife said, oh my God, by all means. And she's an actor too. So she was like, I, of course you should go back. Of course you, you can do both. Why not, you know, do what you can, when you can. And supplement your teaching with a a little job here and there as an actor and literally within two months of doing that i got cast in brooklyn that night oh i didn't realize that was that's what i was trying to figure out that is crazy it was crazy it was crazy and also huge congratulations to you because we hear this all the time in life and there's no judgment whatsoever as we just get older in general it can be a bit i don't know the right words nerve-wracking or yeah we'll go with nerve-wracking or there can be insecurities or whatever to actually want to try something different on you because we have yeah. uh, you know, all this confidence at age 18 and then for some reason it can uh, tend to go. But for you to also put your hand up, I'm getting a theme here of you wanting to you know, be the best version of yourself to say, you know what, I actually think teaching could be really empowering for me because your identity would have been you're an actor and this is what you are. And then to kind right. of step away from it and do something that you know you really feel strongly within you. I think that's really awesome. I think it's uh, also quite courageous to do that because, especially from an identity perspective, I'm an actor, and if I'm not an actor, then maybe I could be a failure. Or I could be insert negative word. Yeah, I well, you know, I had I had let go some time ago of the idea of that my that acting doesn't define me. Nice. I love it. I love it. But I, I knew I would not be lost if it all fell apart. I knew I'd be okay. Because I love other, I, I love so, there's so many things I'm interested in and so many things I'm excited about and this and that and the other, uh, that I would find a way. I knew I could figure it out. Um, so, nice. you know, uh, and yeah, the, 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 when I was in school, when I'd gone back to school too, I, I so appreciated the professors that I had. I had some really good professors. Um, where I live, the the you know, the draw is the community, and uh, so people who were way way overqualified were teaching some of the classes I took, and to be able to sit there and observe them, and it was so much like acting, because it really was, you know, the, our job, my job, one of the main ingredients to my work, is I have to convince myself of what I'm telling you is the truth. And that's how I can convince you that I'm telling you the truth, that I am somebody who I claim to be. And in these guys' case, I knew they'd done these, um, these uh, not speeches, but, you know, classroom, uh, uh, whatever. Debates uh, or something. Well, uh, 
sorry. Um, oh, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you know, when they speak to the class. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, lecture. Terrible. Yeah, lecture. Hello. <laughs> it's yeah, been a while see, for me there, so I resonate. See, well, with age, there does come the old lapses here and there. Uh, but yeah, uh, no. so yeah, at lectures, I would watch them, and and I would just see them get themselves worked up, and I would see them get themselves so excited about, it, and I knew they'd been given this lecture for twenty years. But wow. they still found a way to be passionate about it, to find the passion that they need. And so that kind of also made me think, you know, I think I could do that. I think, and in fact, before I even graduated, I was approached by the theater arts department and the uh, and the film the film department and this and the other. Would you be willing to come in and talk to students and blah 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 blah? And I did, and I and I enjoyed and I worked with them. And I enjoyed working with them. So I thought, you know, when I graduate. Uh, one one of the things I need to do is I need to pay for this education I just got, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, I, so I need a job right out of school. And um, so I, I mean, out of graduation. And uh, so I took, like I say, I got the credentials and made myself available. And it was, wasn't long before I was in demand for taking over. I did long-term, mostly long-term uh, relief, basically. The yeah. teacher had a a physical ailment or a surgery or or they had to go to a sabbatical or something like that and they needed someone for a week to two weeks something like that that those were the jobs that i mostly took so i could spend time with kids and get to know them a little bit and and um uh, and i'd go into it thinking i'm not going to necessarily teach them anything that they don't already know or that, that you know and plus i know how it is when a substitute comes in it's like yeah. You know, you know, <laughs> you know, give them a hard time. So I, I, I knew better than to think I was going to change anybody's lives. But I thought if I can just reach one person, one kid in one of these classes, and maybe five if I'm really lucky, and just let them know that they're being heard, just let them know that they're wow. being that they that I value what they have to say, and that I'm hearing you, and what I'm hearing you say is this. And it was heartbreaking, but sweet too. I'd have kids clinging to me at the oh. end of the day, you know, when I'd be going home, I'd say, uh, okay, come on, I'll walk you out to the bus. You know, can I, I just, I wish you'd just stay here. Can't we just stay here? And I was like, you know, thinking what, what sad world that might must be at home to want to stay at school with a teacher, but you know, well, it's it, first of all, brilliant. Uh, brilliant that you had that philosophy, but it kind of goes back to what you said your wife provided for you you know, that yeah. unconditional love and, you know, yeah. every, everyone has very different um, upbringings and stories and all of that. And God knows what would happen to what was happening at someone's house, like you just said, but for them to just see that a stranger could provide love for them in that space. I personally believe that whether it hits consciously, it definitely hits subconsciously and that will stick with them. How it comes out, I don't know, but that's how I think we change the world is showing, you know, that love. And so I think that is so empowering and I wish we had more of that, but that's kind of like my cure to the world. So I think you do change people's lives doing that. So I'm, I'm glad I, you did that. I'm a, I'm a definite believer in the, you know, the pebble in the pond, you know, the, the little, the little pebble in the pond sends ripples on the water and we don't think much of it or that some people call it the butterfly wing theory, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, but it, it, it doesn't seem like anything at the moment, but actually it has an effect on the universe at some level, cosmic level. I agree. And, You're speaking my you language. Know, since, since, since there's no, since it's all relative, according to Einstein, and I believe what he said was true, you know, that there's really not a whole lot of difference between a microscopic organism and the sun. And the sun is minuscule compared to other suns and, you know, so forth and so on. That you know, we should probably not be so quick to assume that, that we have no power to provide help or our, for ourselves or for others or, and, uh, you know, just accept that, you know, we, we as human beings can provide things for other people if we choose to and for I, ourselves. I agree. It's very empowering. This just springs to mind. Um, when I went to, I've, I've spoken a little bit about this on the podcast, but I went to a um, different type of school where it was kind of like learning by doing. So, Unfortunately, my teacher wasn't a qualified teacher, so I didn't learn core curriculum stuff. So wow. very long story short, when I went to inverted commas, a normal school, and they make me do all the um, testing, I wouldn't uh -huh. do very well at a young age because I didn't know what division was. And right. so if you're graded by a piece of paper, but not actually looking at an individual, you're going to feel like a failure, or less than, not very clever. 
and a terrible way to judge someone's intelligence. But that's a conversation for another time. Well, but no, but that's but you're absolutely right. What you know, because what we communicate to someone, which is you know, you're not very smart, even yeah. if they don't say it, if yeah, they're thinking it, it, a kid especially they know it. So uh, it is important, and I and I, I don't want to take up too much time with this, but no, no, I've no, got to. Go. But there is, but that reminds me of. A pretty funny story. I was with this one group of kids, and there was one little girl in the class, and she talked so very lightly when she would ask, you know. And I would, so I started calling on her regularly, and I'd say, "Now listen, we 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 can't hear what you're saying, so um, what we what you have to say is very very important for all of us to hear. So I want you to make every effort you can to speak up, and so I, and I just stayed with this on her with her through the whole week I was there. Oh. And uh, and she was getting a little better, and she was speaking up a little, and she was getting better and more, maybe a little more confident, I hoped. Anyway, the last day we were there, I was gathering things up and trying to get them ready to go take them to the bus. And well, this is, these are nine-year-olds, roughly, eight, nine-year-olds, something like that. And so I'm wiping down the chalkboard, doing all the things I'm supposed to do to leave the classroom in a semblance of order, and, go, and I want to go home, too. And I feel this t- tug on my pants in the back and I looked down and it's this little girl and she said uh, Mr. B because I had him call me Mr. B just to make it easy you know Mr. B and I said what What do you need what do you need speak up I'm, I'm, I'm busy what do you need <laughs> and she said and she said I want him to tell you that I was and I said oh come on no please you've got to speak up and she went I was going to tell you and I thought oh you know what this may be a private you know thing for her this might she may be I don't know yeah. So I got down on the knee and I said, I'm sorry, what is it? What is it you need? I said, I said, you need a hearing aid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's so funny. Yeah, that, that was a good one. Can't oh, write that kind of thing. <laughs> no, I, I, hope you, I hope you use it. You're right. That, wow. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got tears in my ears. Um, and and hopefully as well that she also uh, would speak up in case everyone else had hearing aid needed hearing aids as well. <laughs> from um, from the story from before, so I was feeling um, less than because I'm doing a test and it's a different language to me, and I assume this is the only way you have to be uh, clever. Done a lot of work on. I'm very happy. I know. Sorry, what I, is I'm, it? I'm sorry. I'm just. Well, you said another language. Is is oh is, if you, no no if you. Um, if you've never seen Division, <laughs> you think it's... Oh, 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 yeah, I, I yeah. understand what you're saying. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And so very long story short, um, my parents got me this tutor who had similar philosophies to you and it was about seeing the individual. And he made me quickly realize that, you know, one, I'm not dumb just because I don't understand something. One, I haven't been taught it, first of all, in general, but also there's different ways to uh, receive information. And he went over different ways of how to present information. He made He challenged me in so many different areas. And I actually, I do screenwriting and I actually think that he would teach me how to write in different ways at much higher to nine or 13 or however long I had him for a year level. And his whole thing was about meeting the individual where they're at. And because of that, I was able to excel um, later on. And I've been thinking about it for years, par- partially because of this podcast. And um, about a month ago, I called him up. So this was someone who was a mentor in my life. Who, who I think has massively changed my life. He didn't know. And we talked about like the ripples in the universe and that effect. I called him up just to say, you know, you've, you've helped me in so many different ways. And I didn't do it um, to get that recognition that I'm doing a good thing. I just wanted to thank him. And he right. was, he was, you know, was on the phone. We were probably going to meet up soon, but he was so taken aback and it really meant a lot to him. And it's amazing what just a little bit of kindness can do. And it goes exactly to what you were saying as well. Yeah. 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 Yep. It's a, it's a wonderful world. I want to go back to, um, so when you're teaching, do you remember, you know, you've, sorry, you've, you're at college. Do you remember day one as opposed to the, uh, the last day, what that experience mm-hmm. was like? I was probably nervous, but I, I mean, as I recall, uh, and just getting used to the whole, you know, new world it was, but I was also excited. I think I, as I recall, but I, I'd be damned if I, I I don't really remember what my first class was to tell you the truth, but it didn't take me long before I realized I'm right where I need to be. This oh, is so cool. This nice. is so cool. The only things that were really, really difficult for me and not a whole lot of fun for me was I had to pass college algebra. 
and I hadn't looked. I hadn't looked at math since I was sixteen years old, whatever wow, I was, you know. Yeah. And yes. uh, so the first, you know, the first t- couple of courses in math, I was pretty adept at. I was okay. I no didn't struggle too much. But then we got into the other, the, which is not even a high level of algebra. I mean, it's not even a high level of math. But for me, it was beyond my grasp, and I struggled mightily, mightily. One, my last class I had to repeat. I had to, I actually had to go back and take it again because I didn't pass. I didn't, you know, even though I worked my butt off and I just, but you know, but other, otherwise I was in classes where I'd be surrounded by 19, 20, 25 year old you know, young people and I'd be listening to the lecturer or I, we'd be looking at a, you know, a, a presentation or something. And it's like, I'd look around and say, don't you guys understand how fucking important this is? This is amazing. <laughs> this is freaking amazing. I mean, my God, just think about that. Just think about the possibility, uh-huh. you know. And they're all like, uh-huh, yeah, all right. And I, it made me think, you know, in a lot of cases, I'm wondering if um, if we might have it backwards a little bit. Some students are ready when they're 18, 19 years old. Yep, but those that me. aren't, you know, I, I wonder if it shouldn't be suggested to them you know, you can always go back to this and you might want to. You really should maybe make room for that in your life mm. because I know I wouldn't have been as, as receptive when I was 18 or 19. I but was, I was like, not either. Yeah, but I was like, oh, my God, I couldn't get enough. It was like, really? Oh, my God, really? He said that? Wow, and I'd read a book and go, oh, my God, that's what a concept, especially like astronomy and and some parts of history and social sciences and all this, you know, it was like, I was, I was, I, I was, <laughs> I was gone, man. I was deep into it. I loved it so much. That's so nice. Cause you know, I was one of the students that you're talking about. We just, I went to uni cause it's something I had to do, but right, I didn't right. appreciate it at all. And even right. though, you know, I then started working as an accountant, then I left that and done a range of studies afterwards. I could only appreciate it then, but I had no way the maturity or the desire when I was first at university to actually yeah. care or absorb it. And I don't think I was alone. I didn't see yeah. too many people. It was typically the mature age students who, well, that's what we call them here. I don't know if you call them that there. They were the ones yeah. flying, absorbing, listening, taking everything yeah. on. Yeah. Like, now I look back at it and go, they were doing it right. And I was doing yeah. it wrong. Well, you were doing what you do. You know, I mean, I like I say, I don't, I don't think I would have been any different myself. Yeah. But I had the by then I had the maturity for you know to uh, understand that some of these things are pretty fascinating. You know, I take I love storytelling, and so it's all you know, it's all kind of related to that. That's you know, his story, history. You know, it's it's you know, when you look at it in those terms, you know. Um, at any rate, I just yeah, I I I loved school. The only thing I didn't like about it was that instead of it paying me to go, I was I was paying to go and I had to figure out how I was going to do all that, but it worked. Well, good for you for doing that. And who would have thought, I always make jokes about algebra because it's like the one thing I never see in my life. I never think about it besides for joke purposes and that, you know, would right, come right. Up, uh, you come up against the, uh, the big A, that's what I always call it. <laughs> the big A. <laughs> the big A. Never, never applied it, never seen it since, but... Right. Uh, it, it has a daunting uh, hold on us. <laughs> it, something you said before, and I think it's really important that, or something I've seen in life, like whether I'm writing a script and I'm like, I've hit a roadblock or I want to try something, but it's not working for me to kind of take a step back and reevaluate what's important. And through my experience in doing and listening to people on the podcast, when people have um, put their egos or whatever to the side and listened to their intuition or their gut or whatever, and they've said they've taken a break or they've put it to hold and try something new. It's allowed for wonderful experiences. And we've spoken about, um, you know, obviously studying, teaching and going to college. And I find it really fascinating that, you know, you'd been doing acting your whole life and you were willing to try something different or new. You'd loved this experience as we can tell. And then not only did you learn a lot, probably also about yourself, but, you know, you learned a lot of topics that you really liked. It brought back the passion for acting. And I find that really remarkable. I, I'm wondering, yeah. do, do you ever think about it like that? Or uh, Oh, it, it did. It did. And I had, uh, before all this, I had spent a lot of time studying with Harry and, and other people as well, but yeah. really had intensive study for like a 10-year span where that was that was what I was committed to, you know, and jobs would come and go. And I, lo- and that, I was always grateful because it helped pay my way to, to the acting class, you know. Yeah. Um, but I really, really felt like I had gained a lot. 
But then I, like you say, I had that remove. I had that, it was just a shift in thinking. Mm -hmm. And it was part, it was just, it's just part of the whole process. But I did a play uh, one summer. I uh, was offered a play out of town. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, summers are, you know, you can, you can get units taken care of. You can get units out of the way to, towards a graduation. But, you know, how many times am I going to have an opportunity like this to go to a beautiful place? It's been Bend, Oregon, which is a lovely, lovely place. And I'd never been there, but I'd heard that it was a lovely place. And it, indeed, it is an incredibly lovely place. And they were starting a new equity house there, an, an equity theater house that seated four or 500 people. So it was a good-sized house. And, um, and, and I joined a group that had been traveling around doing um, uh, uh, Driving Miss Daisy is what they've been doing. And they lost the guy playing the son in Driving Miss Daisy, for anybody who knows the story. And anyway, so I thought, well, this is cool. And the only real challenge I had was that I had like two weeks to prepare. They were ready to go. They had been doing it for years, the actor, the, the other two actors. And uh, so they put up with me while I fumbled my way through rehearsal. But two weeks later, I was like, shit, my brain was supple at that time because of all the work I've been doing in school and, and the work I've been doing with Harry Master George as well. Um, and so in two weeks, I was ready, to, let's go. And, and wow. I had such a, it was a real difference in, in terms of my experiences with theater. Uh, most of my experiences with theater were positive, but there were moments in each one of them where I had to work. I really had to work to get my point across and to get to under, you know, to get through the sequence and whatnot. And then there are other times when it flowed very naturally and very easily. Well, in this one, it was just like, oh my God, I'm, I'm home. This is really, really comfortable. And it's, and it worked really well. It was really, they wanted me to travel with them beyond that. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I got to crack school. <laughs> so I didn't, but, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a different, different set of, it just kind of, everything kind of came together. And, uh, I also believe in the uh, concept, whoever's concept it is, the 10,000 hour concept I'm yeah. probably familiar with. Yeah. Um, and I didn't never know about it, but I heard someone talking about it about 10 years ago. And I thought, well, that's what, that's part of what it is. It's just, there's a comfort now. I know what I'm doing okay. and I know what I'm. Yeah, no, no, I, I love this. You're, you're speaking my language. I'm also wondering because you're trying different things like school, you're learning from Harry. There was also some form of less attachment. Doesn't mean you don't love the play and you're really immersed, but you're feeling more fulfilled in other areas of your life. So you're able to go more with the flow as well. Well, it, it, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of, the shift for me was, uh, I don't think my work before it was limited or bad or anything like that. I, I don't have any regrets about the work I was doing prior to that. Yep. But um, there's a quote by Yo-Yo Ma, you know, the great cellist, Yo-Yo Ma. I'm not sure if you're familiar. It doesn't matter. He's a genius. He's just an absolute genius uh, musician and, uh, you know, award-winning, played with every symphony in the entire world. And, and I was driving somewhere, and I had the national public radio on, and they were interviewing him. And so I was listening to it because I was fascinated by the guy. I've always just thought he was – I think he's a genius. And uh, – and the interviewer said to him, um, what is it like when you're performing for an audience? And he said, I don't perform for an audience. And the interviewer said, I don't understand. What do you mean you don't perform for an audience? Of course you perform for an audience. He says, no, I don't. He said, I experience the music with the audience. Wow. And I almost wrecked my car because I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get off the freeway fast enough to write it down. Uh, uh, and that became kind of what started happening for me is I felt like I was, it was like the story that we were involved in telling on the stage was just one, it was a living thing and that the audience, we were inviting the audience in and I was in touch with the audience to the degree I needed to be so that I knew when to wait for the laughter to stop. But it was not technical at all. It was all just like a dance. It was, uh, and it was just an exciting, uh, wonderful feeling. It really, I finally, finally really got, I mean, I always kind of liked doing plays, but I really figured it out. I was like, oh, now I know what people who are addicted to doing theater 
I know what why they are now because when you have an experience that's really really strong like that, it's uh, it's you want it again, you want to do it again. You know? Stand up comedians also talk about how you know when they get those laughs and how it's so addictive. Right. But for you, it sounds like well, how I phrase it in my very limited like improv or doing various things or even basketball at the lowest level, it sounds like a flow state being so mm-hmm. in the zone. Yeah. Does, yeah. does that re- resonate? I you? mean, ideally, that, ideally that's where you want to be. Yeah. Uh, getting there all the time consistently is I think what separates the great actors in my business from the, uh, the, the rest of us who are doing our best, you know, uh, is that they automatically, they're there. They are just there immediately without question they don't they don't they don't vary from that wow once i mean they they, i mean they may be talking to you about the yankees as you're walking in to do a scene but the minute they say uh uh, rolling rolling cameras you just it's like a boxer you just see them suddenly the focus becomes pure and strong and they don't vary it doesn't there's nothing that could change nothing could throw them nothing can bother them and that's how i feel when i'm doing my work properly I feel like uh, no, there's nothing that can happen that could throw me. Nothing can. I mean, when I was on, when I was doing the one play, the the fellow I worked with on the did, had some scenes with him. The play, um, that particular play, he's a sweetheart of a guy, and he'd been doing this thing for a couple of years. But he would, I could see him. He'd go up. He would forget his lines, and there was no panic for me. It was total sheer abject terror for him. The poor guy was sweating and. And I'd see him and I'd say, now, wait a second. I thought you were coming here to tell me about your sister. What was that? Well, whatever happened to that? And he'd go, <laughs> oh, yeah, my sister was a blah, 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 blah. He'd get back on <laughs> track. You know, I just thought, I get it. I mean, I get it. There's no, there's no reason. There's absolutely no reason for pet terror or anxiety, frankly. There's just, there's no place for it. It doesn't, where does it, where in the story does it say I'm anxious and terrorized? You know, there's no yeah, reason that- for it to be that way. I would love to hear more about this because this is the skill in your craft to be able to just get in the zone of the click of your fingers. I feel, I know you mentioned the 10,000 hour concept, but is it just something you feel like you can just close your eyes and you're in the zone, bam, you get on set and nothing can. I, 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 I found myself uh, like standing, waiting to go to enter or waiting for them to call action. And I'm shooting the breeze with somebody over here for one minute about something and, and say, okay, well, we'll finish this. We'll finish this conversation later. And then the 30 seconds I have left, I can focus on an object and let make that object very important to me and notice every detail of it. And by the time we get ready to go, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Come on. So what did you want me? Why am I here? What are we doing? What's going on? You know? that, and I, I, I do, I, re- I really give Harry, Master George, a lot of credit because that's the kind of thing I mean, I hate to say that this is how he teaches or anything else because yeah. he was Harry and I'm I was one of, I was a student and I don't have any right to really quote him or anything else. But he that was I can say for sure that one of the things he would talk about a lot is that you know there, if you've done your homework, if you've done all the work that you're supposed to do before you get there, it you should play. It's a child's game, folks. It's make believe, you know, and a lot of people poo-poo that, and, and not everybody buys into that right away. Yeah. But over time, you begin to realize he's absolutely right. It's the childlike mentality that you want for that work, I believe, in my view. Yeah. I, I saw Ian McKellen, the great actor, Ian McKellen, interviewed somewhere, and I wish I knew where it was because I would tell every acting student in the world to watch this thing. Yeah. But essentially, that's what he was telling these acting students. It was a group of, uh, a group of people, uh, you know, <laughs> um sorry sorry no that was my fault i, I no not at all my it's girlfriend walked all. in to bring a piece I, of paper I, I can't i can't not say hi to somebody <laughs> yeah, but, she couldn't but hear you but i'll tell her <laughs> at any rate uh uh anyway he just said essentially he after describing you know what what people do and why would they do that to get to where they need to go well but he said basically he said people it's pretend it's make-believe Children do it. We can all do it. But you have to allow yourself. You have to, you have to allow yourself permission and, and to see how willing you are to be totally absorbed by the story, so much so that nothing else takes precedence. Oh, I wish 
everyone could apply this in life. It's not just specific to acting. I've gone no, on. Not. I've gone on so many. Uh, I call them rants, but they're not really rants. First of all, that's mastery level. I just want to comment on that. To be able to get in the flow of the click of the fingers, that's mastery. I hearing hearing you say that is a few light bulbs have gone off in my head about various things to show me a better way. And that's why I love speaking to people like you. It's to, um, you know, learn and improve and do things better. So I really appreciate that story, but also in terms of the play and fun side, we're kind of told that from a kid, you just lose your imagination. You have to be serious. This is how you thrive in the world. And there's no talk about play and fun. And only now I've just turned 31, but you know, for the last few years, have I been looking at playing fun? But most of my friends or people I know, they don't even consider it. And to me, it is, it's almost like crushing in the sense that we kind of lose that. And so I admire actors in particular because they're able to at least get into that state. But at oh, a re- yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, gonna, I'm just agreeing with you. I, I just think it's vital. And I do think that we're, it's, driven, it's beaten out of us almost. You know, it's like success. You have to be serious about this, blah, 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 blah. By the way, you don't look a day past 30, just oh, so you know. Oh, you are uh, too kind. I was hoping for 29, <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's so true. I, in fact, I would say my wife and I will have been married 37 years in November. Oh, nice. And I would say that pr- when people say, wow, what's the, what's the secret or whatever? <laughs> and I say, well, I don't know other than the fact we really care about each other a lot. But a big part of it I, I know for sure is that we laugh a lot we make each other laugh a yeah. lot and sometimes it's so sophomoric and so stupid that we wouldn't dare want anybody else to have eavesdropped <laughs> in to see what we're doing yeah. but 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 we both love it we both are we, we're just we just we 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 just love inter- not entertaining each other but just you know trying our best to say something whack, 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 wacky and weird that'll make the other laugh you know and makes life less serious. And that goes into, yeah. I, I also do that with my girlfriend. Um, we're not 30, um, what do you say? 37 years or almost five. And, and it's not a comparison, but if we're being serious or angry, we try and diffuse it with humor and we can laugh. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're still not recognizing each other's emotions of what's going on, but it just right. makes it so much more fun and playful, not so serious. And I yeah. just wish I've got um, a few of my cousins have got kids down there ages one to five and just see them play and have fun. And it just, it's exciting because we can all do that, whether, you know, yeah, that that's the end of my rant. I think it's really important. And, you know, you talked about guitar, that's playing and having fun. There's so many different ways to play and have fun, but um, I know that it was beaten out of me and speaking to people who aren't necessarily in creative fields who don't have passions or hobbies they'll say to me, no, Michael, I'm an adult. I don't do these things. And I'm just like, it doesn't offend me whatsoever. I'm like, no, don't think like that. You're you're missing out on the beauty that life has to offer. Cheat. You're cheating yourself. Exactly. I've I've heard it too many times. Someone just needs a hug. Um, Yeah. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) In terms of, you know, from flow, I know that you've also written a lot and you've, you've done a book as well. Um, I've got so many questions on this one. I heard it as well. And I know you've done an animation. So, it's called Master and the Little Monk. I want to know where did kind of this idea come from and why you decided to turn it into a book? Well, uh, I was writing a lot at that point in time. I was, you know, I wasn't working as an, I, uh, you know, this is before I got my agents back and, you know, I found another agent and a pen manager to deal with. So I had somebody to look out for me. So I turned what I, and I hadn't started playing music. So I really turned my focus onto writing and I had to do a lot of writing in college, you know, when I went back to college and stuff. And, um, and I was in a workshop actually for that particular story. And the person who ran the workshop said, okay, the theme for next week, I want you all bring in 10, 15 pages of, um, something related to, to, uh, Dharma, you know, in um, college. Interesting. Well, this was, yeah, yes, this was, and it was, um, so it's like purpose. What's, you know, what, you know, and so what I always have done whenever I'm writing anything, I'm not a writer, by the way. You're a writer because you actually work at it. No, I, I, do, I think you I are on. a writer. I, I'll well, let you finish, but you okay. are a writer. Well, at any rate, <laughs> at any rate. Um, and I usually take long walks and go out into the wilderness if I can and get quiet and, and just to kind of keep myself open to see if anything occurs to me. But I was ruminating on the idea of Dharma and purpose, purpose in life, which I think is really a valuable and important. Agreed. Very important thing. And uh, and so this idea 
came to me and it, it was just, it's a fable. And I just, it just flowed out of me and I just put it together and, you know, then worked on it, shaped it up, polished it if I could and chopped it up and, and then read it to my wife before I went back into the workshop the next night. Um, you know, cause she, her feedback is usually right on the money. And, um, and she doesn't pull punches. She says, she'll say, she's not cruel, but she will say once in a while, she'll say, I don't think it's your best, you know, that kind of thing. But, but when I finished reading this to her, she had tears in her eyes. Wow. And I said, wow. I said, that, that affected you. And she said, that's beautiful. I just think that's so beautiful. And I said, well, thank you. That makes me feel great. I feel fantastic. Now I feel much more confident reading it in front of these people in nice. the workshop tomorrow night. And at any rate, uh, she said, you have to make me a promise. And I said, what? And she said, if you, you've got to try to get this thing published. Cool. And, uh, and I said, well, and she said, no, you have to promise me you'll try. So I sent it out to a few agents and people like that. And they said, well, you know, it's, it's a fable and it's not really directed towards kids. It's really, and I said, you're right. It's really for all ages. That's how I, the way, I mean, I don't think of it in terms of marketing. I'm not a yes, marketing I, person. Yeah. Um, and you're right. I didn't, I didn't write it. I did. I didn't want to write it down for kids like to, so that, Oh, I'll, I'll make it so that they can understand. I thought I'm, you know, you look at, you know, uh, works from the past writers writing fables and so forth from in the past. And I, I needed friggin' dictionaries to get through them because they didn't, they didn't choose simple phrasing and words and this and the other. So I, I, I put it and I got good responses from the, from the workshop I was into. Uh, the guy who ran that workshop was, was really quite good. And uh, so at any rate, after like the second season, I think it was when we knew we had some, some uh, we, had, we had another little bit of work coming our way from Brooklyn Nine Nine. Uh, then I, I just went ahead and said, you know what? I'm not going to wait for anybody else to publish that. I'll just do it myself. And I had become friends with a, one of the art directors on Brooklyn Nine Nine, a very talented guy who's really his career has taken off since Brooklyn Nine Nine. He's an incredible artist. Uh, at any rate, I said, I said, would you be? Because I got along well with him. I just liked him. I trusted him, and I liked him. And I said, would you be interested? Can I read a story to you and see if, if it has any effect on you? Would you be interested at all in illustrating something? And he said, I've never done it. And I said, well, I've never done this either, you know. So we did it. And uh, and he did wonderful work, I thought. He got, he captured just what I was after. And, of course, all I heard from anybody was uh, kids like the color. They like things to be in color. And this is black and white charcoal. It's like, well, how can you do this? And I was going, I don't know. Maybe you're right, you know. At any rate... Uh, it did very well, but I, um, but I, you know, I slowly but surely shut it down because it was just taking up quite honestly being the, you know, the packager and the, you know, mailer and the, you know, everything, you know, my yeah. wife helped everything involved. I just said, you know, I really only wanted kids. I really just wanted to reach somebody out there with this because it's a, it's a story about kindness and animal welfare and, uh, and where the, where you might not believe it could come from but there might be help out there in the universe for you in ways that you might not appreciate or understand um so since then i've i've just I, i've gone to you know but covid really kind of threw a wrench into the world oh, but course, yeah <laughs> but i would go to libraries and elementary schools and junior high schools and stuff like that and i'd hand out the books to everybody and then I would read them with them following along. And then I'd do answer question, answer about, and they all wanted to know about Brooklyn nine, nine really, <laughs> but that's okay. I said, that's all right. That's cool. You know, but I said, any other questions? Said, yeah. Why'd you have them do this? And I said, well, I don't know. You, what do you think? What, what, what do you think? Uh, you know, why do you think that that happened in the story? Why do you think that happened to that little boy? What, 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 you know, why were people mean to him? Why, why, why do you think that was, there may not be an answer. But don't you, do you know anybody in your life where someone's being mean to a kid and you can't even figure out why they're being mean to them? And I'll, every kid would go, yeah, I do. I, I know somebody in our school who's being picked on, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. So it's still out there. And, uh, but I have no, I have no um, apparatus to, you know, get it out there. So what I'm doing, I, and I just, just this last week, drove down to a couple of towns near me and, and told them, I said, as soon as COVID is done, they all are like, would it be okay if we sell it? I said, you can do whatever you want with it. You can give it away if someone doesn't have any money and you can sell it. Oh, I don't wow. want, you don't, don't, don't send me the money. Use it for the library. You know, our libraries are hurting 
prosper financially. So it turned out to be a good thing in that regard. So even if it just raises a few bucks here and there to help help out with something at the these libraries and in elementary schools, that's fine with me, and even junior high schools. So, but kids, you know, they they're really not interested if it's not if it's not on a uh, yeah video know, game or thing, whatever. Yeah, it's like you know, right, right. So I sorry. I uh, I admire first of all that's really um awesome of you to do that, but I admire all the choices that you've made. You know, often with there can be a gatekeeper. And if someone, if a publisher, for example, is like, oh, it has to be this way or this way, and it's not in alignment with what you want, we can just go, well, it's not good enough or it's not going to be made. But you actually put your hand up and say, you know what, I'm going to go down a different route and my route. And I think that's, you know, part of the success of it. And then also just, you know, honoring yourself. And obviously, um, you got high integrity in this regard. You know, you heard about colors. I really like the style that um, you chose off the charcoal. And, you know, you felt that was what was needed for your project. And all these different little things, which I'm sure you would have heard advice and made changes, but knowing what was right for your project and not, I think that's a life skill that we all need because maybe this is just a great what if. Maybe it went to a publisher and they changed it completely and now you've got this um, this book that doesn't feel like it's yours or not what you were trying to get out there. Correct, yeah. I mean, again, it's my philosophy was very much like it when I was a teacher, which is, or when I'm an actor doing something, it's like, I, I don't, you know, I don't need to reach everybody, but if I can reach anyone, any group, any one or any group of people or anything small, or large, whatever it is, and that, and it makes a difference in their life, man, then I've done my work. That's really, that's where it's at. Amazing. I, um, I saw an Amazon link. Uh, there are only six books left, but I will find, um, I'll put it in the episode notes. So if people are interested, they can check it out. I think there's also an animation as well, which looks pretty well, cool. Well, it's it's Vimeo, and it's um and it's simple. It's just really the pages turn, and the you know, and it goes from so it's it's not like moving animation. It's just it's just uh, video of the uh, book itself with my voiceover. I, yeah, I, I narrate. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, and hopefully, uh, we'll bring it back out to the universe, and you know, be considered being a um a five part um five season TV series or um five um five different movies or we're putting it out there and we'll, we'll see uh, whatever like i say if it if it helps one kid is being picked on or one person one kid who's upset about the world and thinking maybe he'd take it out on an animal or something like that if it changes anything any kind of thinking along those lines then i've done my job and that's all i care about i like your philosophy and talking about philosophies there seem to be um from what i've seen and heard various different philosophies um, in the book as well. I assume it was this part of an upbringing thing or is it something that you've accumulated through your learnings over the years and maybe therapies, meeting your Harrys, or has it just been something that's always been in you? I, I think it's a little of all that, really. Um, uh, you know, the animal aspect of it was largely, um, I believe, influenced certainly by my uh, maternal grandfather and grandmother's ranch where they raised cattle and they raised quarter horses and they always had chickens and they always had this and then the other. And I, and I spent summers there uh, growing up and I loved it. And I just, and I love them so much. And uh, so, um, you know, I know that there are images certainly in there that I had Eric, my, the illustrator, Eric Scottness is his name. I had him, um, I'd say, here's the picture of what I'm talking about. And this is, you know, this wind, you know, a windmill or a, or a feeding trough or something like that, you know, so that definitely played a part. And the other, I don't question, I, I don't really, I don't really question too much of where things come from. They just, that's why I say I'm not, a, you know, a writer to me makes sure that they get something, something down pretty much every day. If not, some people work six hours a day, some people work one hour a day, whatever. I, I just wait to be, to be, thought, oh, that's a good idea. And I'm, you know, and then I, you know, so if you wait for an impulse to write, then you're not really a writer. I just, I'm a storyteller for sure, but yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a hardcore writer. I'm not a real, I, I'm, it's a dis disservice to people like yourself. We'll, who we'll agree time. to disagree. I, I actually go more with your philosophy. Um, I've written, you know, they're not made, but one was about to bit. we'll put it out there to the universe. I've written let's just say roughly six screenplays purely from, um, you know, what you're talking about inspiration or when it comes and, you know, I, I meditate to get a lot of my ideas or even if you go for a walk like you and it's, right. 
yeah, it's, it's amazing when you can listen to see what's out there, which it sounds like you've done not only in this book, but you know, you've alluded to this before and I know you've done other writings as well. And whether it's a blog or just something for yourself, I'm still think that's what makes you a writer, but gonna- well, that's cool. But I got to tell you six screenplays. Is, that's a, that's no small feat. That's if you've done some work. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're a writer and uh, we're going to end it. Uh, we're going to end that part there. You can't convince me otherwise. I'm also just wondering from um, the writing to acting side in terms of vulnerability, when you write, you're pouring a part of yourself on the page, but when you're acting, you're also revealing an element of yourself. Do you ever see a difference in terms of the vulnerability or it's all the same to you? Well, they're similar. Um, and it's, they're, they're really both, the, they both come out of the same fountain, which is the uh, storytelling. It's storytelling. Simple as that, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, uh, the discipline is a little different, you know, when you're punching away the keys or right scrawling on a pad. Pardon me. <laughs> but um, as opposed to learning and absorbing information that you keep all kind of locked in your in your head and in your heart, you know, when you go, go get ready to act. But they're really, they really come from the same well, I would say. They do because they're all, it's really just about, you know, let me tell you the story about this guy here and who I am and I'm so-and-so and I'm his friend and I'm going to tell you this is what happened and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and then his wife comes in and she, you know, and of course that doesn't really happen in theater or in film, but that's essentially what's going on really. You know, uh, there's not a, unless there's a narrator telling you all this stuff, um, you're just, you're just living the story. It's, uh, it's, that's really what you're doing. That's when I, I talk to students about this and I say, you know, if you can, if you can re- imagine yourself with a novel or a short story or something that you were so absorbed by that you felt like you were there, you could smell, you could feel the temperature you could do. All, that's the mindset you want to have when you're acting. That's where you want to be. You want to you want to be lost in the story, lost in the world of the story, and not lost in a bad sense, but lost in a good sense, and that you've left behind your concerns, your personal your personal concerns, your personal ego, your personal, and instead you've given yourself over entirely to the playwright. Really, I love that. I love that philosophy. Just you know, allowing for what is in front of you and being so present in the moment and allow for flow to. Great, great mindset and philosophy. Um, before we do a rapid fire segment, there were so many questions about Brooklyn Nine Nine from various fans. It's uh, crazy how powerful and big that show's been. Just kind of wrapping up from what you said, you know, you finish teaching and then you get that call to do Brooklyn Nine Nine. Did you ever expect after doing the um, college degree that you get something the nature of Brooklyn Nine Nine? Well, I don't. I no. I I I didn't really see Brooklyn Nine Nine coming. I'd had trouble over the years convincing uh, agents and casting people and whatnot that I could that I could do comedy. Uh, they they said no, you do drama. That's what you do. They 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 like to pigeonhole you. Put you can. in a box. Yeah. Put you in a box. Yeah. Um, so I guess I didn't really see that. Although I always used to think that's the job and that's the, for television. That's the gig because it's a 30 minute episode. So the hours aren't crazy. And it just looks like in the right circumstances, it looks like fun. And this was so much fun. I mean, everybody was funny. Everybody was decent to each other. And from the bosses all the way to the crew and everything else and everybody in between, it was, it was really a joy. It was really something else. You, um, we've had your colleague on, uh, Joel McKinnon Miller and, yeah. Told my guy, yeah. told my man, and uh, it's not people are really appreciate it. I was also thinking, you know, listening back to his or when I did his podcast, that you created like a iconic TV duo, and I, I always find like, what's it like being a part of? I know you've done other stuff in your career as well, but part of a uh, TV history as well. Uh well, I mean that. Where if it's very flattering to hear that, but I, I, <laughs> the only thing I can say is that we, you know. We we went in without – they hadn't re- really written much of anything for us. They wanted to have a couple of old guys in there, there just showing up. So it's not just young people, young people, young people, you know, yeah. and just to balance it out a little bit. And um, so we were – while we were said, okay, you're going to be in the background of this shot doing the blah, 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 
we said, well, instead of us just sit like staring at a computer screen and pretending like we're make, writing out a report or whatever, uh, let's figure out something we can do that's interesting that has to do with the story. It always had to, it had to have some connection to the story, even if it was, the connection was that these guys are so out of it, they're so stupid that they that they're they don't even know what's going on. But we would uh, we would come up with bits, we would do little things, and we kind of threw it out there, halfway expecting them to say, "Cut, uh, you guys don't do that, please." You know, just <laughs> just sit there, you know. But yeah. instead, these wonderful producers and writers would come up to us between takes and say, "What you guys are doing is really funny, man." Uh, <laughs> And then they finally started saying, "Any anything you want as far as props go, anything you you know you need or whatever." And then they started writing for us, and you know they started figuring out stuff for us to do because they'd see what we were doing and they'd say, "You know what, we should have you know." And so it just turned into a lovely, uh, it developed into a lovely thing. It was really fantastic. Why I love this story, and I know there's there's more to it as well. And please correct me if I'm wrong. You kind of shot your shot in the sense of you were trying new things. You could have just, you know, not really, you, you were respectful and you um, abided by the rules of what was going on Brooklyn Nine-Nine and you guys were playful, playful, but you guys were trying new things in, a, in the right environment. And because of that, it made you become part of one of the regulars where perhaps, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if you hadn't been trying new things in that way, you may have not been a regular. You know, you put in your, your skill set and your playfulness and it created something not only great for the show but also for you as well and i think that's really awesome when people can kind of put their hand up and you know as i said shoot your shot in a respectful way as well i think you know it's a it's a bit of a game change for everyone that you can try these different things and you know pulled it you pulled it off well yeah you know part of it for us was we just thought they could have had anybody do this if that's if they, they they there's got to been some reason why they would want us to be the guys here, and we have a lot, frankly, to offer. Yeah. Um, so why don't we, you know? Uh, and and it was de- it was developed in the earliest, like in the pilot, that these guys should have retired years ago. They're just hanging on for their pension and their retirement, and they but they make a hell of a good cup of coffee. So we just took that and ran with it. We just became we just exaggerated that as much as we could. And at the same time, knowing that the the focus of the scene was on the people in front of us, we're in the back, you know. So we don't, you know, you, there's nothing worse than somebody in the background like trying to draw <laughs> attention to themselves. <laughs> so we would before. just, we would just, we would just do, you know, things that we thought were natural, but that you know, when you see these two old fat guys doing it, it's like that's really fucking funny. <laughs> that's yeah. really pretty funny. So again. That developed into, and once in a while, we'd, we'd throw things, and once we, we kind of became accepted and we were regulars, we felt very comfortable saying, hey, what if we, you know, we got the shot, we got, we got the dialogue, the scripted stuff, because Andy and Chelsea and uh, Joe Latrulio, and w- they were always saying, can I try something here? Let me try. I've got an idea that may not work, but, you know, I'll try. And some, quite often, it would end up in the show, as you know, because it was pretty funny. Yeah. And Joel and I, Joel and I got to the point where we would say, not all the time, because uh, we knew where we, we knew where we were at as far as, you know, the pecking order goes, so to speak. But we would say, what if I said this? And a lot of times they'd go, oh, that's funny. Let's at least shoot it. We may not use it, but let's shoot it, you know. So, yeah, we, we it was just great. Again, having fun. We just had a, it was, I, I didn't say this to the producers, but I said it to Joel on a regular basis is that what these guys don't know is they, they, I would be doing this for a lot less money because I just have, (laughs) I'm having so much damn fun, but I'm really glad they're paying us pretty good money. But, uh, but uh, the, but I would be here for a lot less. I'd be here much cheaper. They knew. I I have huge (laughs) respect for the whole story in the sense that um, what was, if you remember, what was that moment? Cause you, Originally, it started where I think um, from memory, please correct me if I'm wrong, you, you didn't know if you were going to be like part of the show um, right. for that long. And then right. what was the moment when you realized that you'd be a series regular? Well, we, the first, in the first season, we were literally hired independently each episode. And so Joel and I kept on thinking, well, you know, they may, we may not get called next week, but every Wednesday, halfway through the week, they'd say, okay, table read tomorrow for next week's episode. And we get an invitation to it. 
we want you to be there. And Joel and I would high five and say, Jesus, that's so fun. <laughs> we were so happy. It's like, God, we got another week's work. And nice. by the end of the season, it was like, Jesus, we've done all of these. And we now they're in, they're actually having us do more. We're we're kind of almost becoming part of the team, really. And then in the off season, that's when they, they called our representatives up and said, we want to make them regulars. So no, we don't have to think about it anymore. And that was when we knew it was like, oh, God, what a that's that's just a wonderful, wonderful gift. So lucky, so wonderful. I love your perspective on this and the gratitude as well on the play and the fun. It wraps up everything we've spoken about in this chat. It is brilliant. Before we go, I reckon we'll do a quick rapid fire segment. So okay. The, so the first thing that springs to mind, but please take your time to think about it because they're never not that they're not really rapid and I won't comment on them because I always derail them. What are you most proud of? Uh, my marriage. What's been your special ingredient to work all these years? Patience and, um, and, uh, persistence. What was the feeling like when Brooklyn nine, nine ended for the official time? I think it was ending a few times in between or you weren't sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sweet, but sad, sweet, but sad. Yeah. Would they ever, I got this before with Joel as well. Would they ever bring it back for like a spin-off movie or anything? Or was it done, done? As far as you're oh, concerned. I, I don't really know. Uh, I, I mean, I would jump at the chance to be able to do to work with Joel again. Joel working with Joel is just a dream come true. But um, but no, I I kind of think it's probably run its course. We'll see. What is the funniest thing someone has maybe tweeted about you or commented about you or something that springs to mind? Doesn't need to be on social media. Tweeted okay. Send him at me. Um. When I was doing a show called Brooklyn, uh, uh, Baba Black Sheep back in the 1970s, um, John Larroquette, who uh, has become since become a dear friend of mine, um, we were all waiting on the first day of shooting. We were waiting for the van to come pick us up to drive us where we were going. And I was playing a person my age. I was playing a 19-year-old, and I had a hairpiece. Otherwise, I looked like I was 25, 6, 27 years old. So I was wearing a hairpiece, <laughs> and John – who's a wild man, especially in those days, he said, who's the fat fuck with the wig? <laughs> <laughs> we became lifelong, we uh, became lifelong friends after that. I realized, uh, okay, this guy's, this guy's, he, he's got me. He's got my sense of humor. That's cool. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you could laugh that. That's great. Um, <laughs> that's how a lot of my friendships have formed as well. Um, <laughs> next big dream or goal. <sighs> um, I would really love to work my way back into drama now that I've now that I'm now considered no he's you you do comedy you don't do drama you know it's like it's, <laughs> it's like, yeah. all flipped it uh you know I have a hankering right now to play a judge or to play an attorney or to play someone who has uh you know uses their words carefully and who are uh intelligent so I mean I I think I'm pretty good at playing a a, a buffoon but I, uh, I would like to, I'd like to flip it. I'd like to do the opposite. Nice. And does the pigeon holing, pigeon holing, or putting you in a box, does that bother you, or is it a compliment? Well, it is what it is. I mean, it used to bother me when I was young, especially when I couldn't get in to read for a sitcom where I knew I was right for the part. You know, it used to really bother me. But you know, there comes a time when you realize, why am I beating my head against the wall? Why am I trying so hard? Trying so hard to convince someone of something that they don't want to believe. Mm. It's like, I, I, you know, so, you know, I, I no, it, 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 it doesn't bother me now, but it, it did when I was younger. Yeah, it did. And what would you, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? If I knew I couldn't fail, I probably would be like, I would might try hang gliding or flying an airplane or something. I have a terrible fear of heights. So there's never even been a consideration. But I like driving a car, and I've driven some really fast cars in safe in safe situations. I'm not a person who drives through a neighborhood at 90 miles like an hour. School zone. <laughs> yeah, right. I just like what? What do you? Or even on a freeway, what are you? De you're depending on all of us to keep you safe. Why are you doing this? You know, you could kill any one of us. But I've been on race tracks before, where I've been given the keys to some fairly powerful cars, and one car in particular. And uh, I loved it. I love 
I, I, I haven't, I, I haven't done this in years, but I used, I used to love speed. I really loved, I love, I rode a motorcycle for a long time. Uh-huh. I love, I love all that stuff, but you get me in an airplane and I'm like white knuckling every minute. And you know, I like, I'm not crazy about it. It's just lack of control and heights. It's heights. I really don't like the heights. I uh, resonate with that as well. I've got a weird, like I can go in planes. I've yeah. gone out of an airplane as well. But you've when it's jumped, some, you've jumped, jumped out of one. I have. Holy moly! <laughs> I would. I don't think I would do it again. But it's something about looking over where there's no right, like where there's little railing. That's what gets me. It's like weird. Oh, God, yeah. me too. Oh God. Yeah. It's, I, it's like if someone says you got to look at the view. I'm like on all fours, sneaking up on it. Like, that's that, good. That's good. I see. Yeah. Yes. A safe distance, like a safe. few feet away. Thirty yeah. or forty. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we actually have a Formula One Grand Prix right where I um, live. Oh, wow. And so cool. I actually have gone on the track like 100 times, but you can only go, I don't know what the difference is, but 40 kilometers an hour, which oh, is yeah. nothing. It's, it's, yeah. You, yeah. It's, it's, but that's still, how cool. It is. How but cool. ev- yeah. Everyone says that, but when you've been doing it for like 10 years, it's just a normal road to me. But yeah. That's of a course. Yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. But uh, uh, are you a Formula One fan? No, not at all. I just want all. it's yeah, just something yeah, that I yeah. can put on yeah, the resume. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Um, last two questions. Any advice you want to give to someone who wants to try something different or new, but perhaps are a bit fearful of doing so? I would, I would say, if in your heart it's something you really know that you kind of really need to do, then I would say take take the leap of faith. Because it's really, I believe, it's about knowing that you individually, you are enough to you. It, it, there is no such thing as failure. I know that's part of the title of the show. But there really is no such thing as failure because the, the key to falling or failing is just get back up. Just get back up. It's okay. No one's thinking any of this stuff. No one's thinking that you're a jerk or a weirdo or whatever. They're too busy in their own minds thinking about their lives. And really, so just try, yeah, take the leap of faith. You you won't regret it. It's scary. It's scary. But it's like when I was a kid and someone, I got up on top of a slide to a pool and I was like, ah, uh, I don't, I want to go back down. And the person behind me is like, no, 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 just do it once and you'll love it. And I, no, I can't. And they pushed me. And I couldn't, they couldn't keep me off that slide for the rest of the day because it was just, it was exciting. It was fun. It was cool. And I was safe, you know, but, you know, so I would say take the leap of faith. If your heart is open and if you're doing it for the right reasons, you will have assistance you may not even know about out there in the universe. You will be guided. You'll be okay. You're going to be fine. We've got the um, promo of all the podcasts. That's going to be the start of now the Funny and Failure podcast. That was brilliant. Um, I could see you also being in the flow saying that as well. That was very empowering. Um, last question before I ask how people can follow you and keep up to date with you. What is the one question I should have asked you? Oh. Hmm. Should have. I don't like the word should have, but um, could have. Um Golly. Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, God, you've stumped me. Uh, Excellent. Could have, could have, that you could have asked me, but didn't. You, you could have asked me my wife's name. Her name is Danielle Aubuchon. And uh, her father, Jacques Aubuchon, was also an actor. Oh, wow. And a very fine actor and a, and a very accomplished guy who had, did a lot of film and television and f- theater. And she is adorable. And she's in, the, she's in the fifth season opening episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. She plays my prison babe, my I prison babe, Jenny. <laughs> I'll ask one quick question about that. What was it yeah. like working with her? Um... Oh, it's a blast. I've worked with her a number of times. We, uh, we, long before we got married, we, we did plays together, and that's how we met. And uh, she's just a trip. She's just such a joy to work with. She's she just it's easy. It's so easy being with her and working with her. So, yeah, it was great. And uh, on that day on the set, she was she was so happy to be there. It was so much fun. She she'd seen me having so much fun. And I'd come home from work and talk about how much fun it had been. And then she got the chance to go experience that. So that was lovely. 
I love that you had that. I love your relationship and you're still smiling after all of these years. That's a big credit to not only uh, Danielle, but also you for, you know, thriving together. Thank you so much for doing this. I, um, there's so many things that spring to mind, but I love your insights and, you know, you go with the flow kind of mentality and all the learnings that you've done. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing with sharing them with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're a delight. I love Dirk's story of how he followed his passion and went back to college in his 40s. It can be daunting for various reasons we discussed to participate in change and try something new, but Dirk knew he had to do this. Instead of pushing the boulder uphill, Dirk made a decision that he thought would bring him more happiness and fulfillment while also learning a thing or two in the process. What is remarkable is that it also helped bring back his love for acting. It highlighted to me that we don't necessarily need to do the thing, that is, acting, to appreciate acting. Living life and having experiences helps bring back the balance and returns us to a state of equilibrium. Then on top of this, the miraculous happened and Dirk received the role for Brooklyn Nine-Nine and the rest is history. So he also goes one step further and encourages us to follow what lights a fire in our heart, to take the leap of faith knowing that we are good enough to back ourselves. He says, we won't regret it, and I agree wholeheartedly. So I'll leave you with this epic quote. Stop being afraid of what could go wrong and start being excited about what could go right. Tony Robbins. Thank you for listening to the Funny and Failure podcast, exploring the deeper side of comedy. (laughs) 